Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us today for our Transforming Clinical Practices Initiative webinar. This webinar is supported through a grant awarded to the PCPCC for a support and alignment network by the Department of Health and Human Services Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. The content provided are solely the responsibility of the authors and do not necessarily represent the official views of HHS or any of its agencies. Today's educational event, co-hosted by the Center for Patient Partnerships, will review the advent of patient experience as a vital measure of healthcare quality and highlight innovations designed to elicit patient stories about health and healthcare with more narrative richness than the current validated instruments invite, a subject that is very near and dear to our hearts at the PCPCC. So before we begin our presentation, I'd like to go over a few housekeeping items. Please use the webinar software to ask questions or provide comments. To do this, submit your questions in writing using the drop-down question box on your screen. We will ask the speakers to respond to questions immediately following their presentations. The speakers will be available for office hours for an additional 30 minutes past the hour for those who would like to stay for additional discussion following the presentation. Also, please note that slides and the recorded presentation will be posted on our website within the next 24 hours. In addition to this webinar, past webinars and resources from the PCPCC Support and Alignment Network dedicated to increasing partnerships with patients, families, and community-based organizations in practice transformation are available at www.pcpcc.org slash tcpi. So, Let's get started. I'm pleased, I'm pleased to induce, introduce our two speakers. Rachel Grobe, Director of National Initiatives, Center for Patient Partnerships, is a senior scientist at the Department of Family Medicine at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Mark Schlesinger, Professor of, Health Policy, uh, Professor of Health Policy Fellow, Institution for Social and Policy Studies at Yale University. We would like to thank both Rachel and Mark for the time and expertise that they are about to share with us. We're thrilled to have them present today. So now I'll turn it over to Rachel, who will begin the presentation. Thanks so much, Fatima, and lovely to be with all of you today. So we are going to begin with, sorry, um, just a introduction uh, to the Center for Patient Partnerships, which is really happy to be co-hosting the webinar today. And then we will do a brief look at where we have been and a much longer look at where we are going with patient experience, highlighting two um, innovative projects that Mark and I have been collaborating on. So just a, a moment about the Center for Patient Partnerships. As you can see, we um, infuse patients' voices into what we call at the center the elemental brew of health and health care. We focus on patient advocacy and professional education, working directly to pair uh, students in all of the health professions with patients who are having difficulty navigating the health care system, something probably all of your listeners can relate to. We also focus on service co-design and research and policy advocacy, and the projects we're going to highlight today are in that last category, but a real sweet spot for us there is to focus on projects that don't have a 17-year pipeline to translation, um, but rather can start making a difference in the lives of real people very quickly. So where have we come from with patient experience? This is a whirlwind three-minute history. Um, we can return to this in the Q&A period if people are interested. But we began with um, patient satisfaction, or at least our history today begins with the 1980s when attention first began to be paid to patients' point of view and pers perspective. But the concept back then was more about satisfaction, ratings of care, and I've got this slide of Jello to show that it's something important. We all care about uh, uh, what, what we eat and how we eat it and how things feel, for example, in a hospital stay, um, but maybe not a concept yet as fully formed as it became when we moved on to 
looking at experience of care and the advent in the 1990s of the consumer assessment of healthcare providers and systems out of AHRQ, our federal agency that looks at quality. And these patient experience surveys, many of you may have seen them, um, like the one pictured here. CAPS isn't the only provider of these kinds of surveys, um, but is the most well-known one. And these are designed to focus on assessments for which consumers or patients are the best or only source of information, um, and also to focus on aspects of care that consumers and pa patients themselves identify as important. So um, the idea here is to improve the experience that patients are having and to capture that in a way that's different than just saying, um, were you satisfied or not? It can also capture what people's expectations were of care. The next move is to a much more full and robust idea of care that really puts patients in the center of a world that may include their health and healthcare experiences, but has to do with all the dimensions of their lives, only some of which obviously are pictured here. Um, this has been uh, advanced by moves in narrative medicine. Many of you may have heard, for example, of Arthur Frank's uh, wounded storyteller and the incredible work that he's done around narratives. There's narrative medicine programs now around the country. Um, the concept of capturing patients' full and robust stories, so from satisfaction to ratings um, of care to capturing experience with surveys and closed-ended questions to the telling of full stories. That's the trajectory that we're on. And we've really seen the experience of care become integrated into, um, into measurement, into reimbursement and incentive systems in healthcare. It is no longer a small time pastime of a few people, um, but rather, as you can see here, for example, at the Institute of Healthcare Improvement's triple aim. It is uh, one of the three cornerstones of care. Uh, it's been highlighted by the Institute of Medicine. It is part of um, many of our concepts of care in patient-centered medical homes, in um, shared decision-making. And here you can see just some of the proliferating organizational infrastructure around patient experience. We have institutes and annual meetings and conferences. We have now two journals uh, that are publishing about patient experience. So we have come a long way, and yet we have really a long way to go in uh, both the art and the science of patient experience. And we're going to focus today on talking to you about two projects that really highlight this move um, from anecdotal stories about patient experience to a science of patient experience, which captures uh, the full potential of powerful stories while avoiding some of the problems that occur when a single story stands in for a more robust, representative, and complete view of patients' experiences in the plural. Another way we've been talking about this in the various teams we've got working on it across the country is that it's a move from patient voice to patient's voices in the plural, um, because in our democracy and in our healthcare system that serves such diverse things, we really need to know what's going on for people, not just for one person who may testify before Congress or make this. So here, our definition of rigor um, includes rigor with sampling, which needs to be purposeful to ensure that what we learn is representative of a broad population. Um, we need to elicit 
patient experience carefully so that our stories that we learn are balanced and complete and meaningful. And we need methods to interpret the patient experience data, that qualitative data that we get with rigor so that it is coded for themes as well as for variation so that we have incorporated team-based approaches to ensure um, that we're triangulating and incorporating um, rigor and with attention to inductive learning so that we are being told what we need to know from what patients are recounting in their stories and not only working from a hypothesis. And I am now going to hand it over to Mark to elaborate on our concept of rigor and tell you about the first of our two projects for today. Thank you, Rachel, and uh, welcome to you all. So Rachel and I have been collaborating on this part of our work, the two projects you're going to hear about today for about about the past five years. And I'm not going to go into a Bill Clinton history of how long we've been working together. Uh, the first project we're going to describe to you, which is part of this larger team represented by all the authors on that sounding board, which are at the top of the slide there, uh, emphasizes particular dimensions of rigor, of the three dimensions Rachel just introduced. It focuses on sampling, in a very careful way by embedding the collection of patient narratives into very large-scale patient experience surveys, like the CAP survey or like uh, other kinds of patient experience surveys, which are given to tens of millions of people a year. And so in order to make that possible, we had to think about how do you collect patient narratives in a way that's sufficiently concise that it can fit inside of one of those other surveys, not distort the results you're getting from those other surveys, but be implementable on very large scale. And then second, we focused a lot on, on what is listed here as elicitation rigor. That is of figuring out how to ask a sequence of open-ended questions in ways that get people to tell a fulsome story about their patient experiences, and one which can be told by people who are not used to telling stories, not just the vocal people, not just the verbally facile people, not just people who are comfortable writing because they think people will pay attention, but to get the people who don't think any of those things to actually be willing to tell their story in a fulsome way. The second project, which Rachel will introduce to you in a bit, looks in an equally rigorous way, but defines rigor differently in ways you'll, you'll hear about more in just a moment. And what importantly here is that you can think about rigor in multiple ways, implement it in different ways, and each of them tell you something importantly different about the nature of patient experience. All right, so again, this first project which we typically refer to as the elicitation project, uh, is designed to work built into these very large patient experience surveys. And so what we needed to do was to come up with a sequence of open-ended questions, what we call the elicitation protocol, that can be answered in five, maybe 10 minutes, because you, know, you can't keep people on the line or on a website forever answering the survey. So it had to be sufficiently sharp and precise. It could be done with relative speed, yet still capture the key elements of each patient's story. To do that, we had to kind of develop both what we mean by rigor in this particular context, uh, how we're going to operationalize our definition of rigor. And people, even though people have worked a lot on patient narratives, and as Rachel mentioned, there's a rich and robust literature on narrative medicine and a rich literature on narratives in all different aspects of people's lives, people really hadn't thought that much about the kinds of rigor we're looking here. So we literally had to develop notions of rigor from the ground up. And so what we did distinct criteria, which we're going to share with you now. First, that the elicited narrative be complete. 
That is that it tell and contain all the key elements that matter to that person about their clinical encounters. Second, that it be balanced. Now by balanced, we don't mean that it have some good and some bad. If the patient experience was all good, they just have to say good. If the patient experience was all bad, they just have to say bad. Balanced here means that it contained the same mix of bad and good in the elicited nearly experienced in their healthcare encounter. So it's matching reality in terms of the balance of good and bad elements. Third, that the narrative they recount be meaningful, which means that if someone all has never met them before goes and listens to the narrative that they've given, whether it's another consumer thinking about selecting doctors or a clinician trying to figure out how to do quality improvement, that they can figure out what happened. They can see why they were unhappy and what the sequence of events were that led to that particular outcome. Then finally, fourth, and this is the critical one, that the elicited narratives be representative, meaning that, again, the people who are not used to telling their stories are just as willing to participate in the surveys and can tell their stories in equalized and meaningful ways as people who are better educated and more used to giving voice to their experiences in healthcare and other settings. So those were our criteria. We're going to come back to them and illustrate how we use them in this particular context. But again, the key here is to set some standards, to define what we mean by rigor in a way that we can then judge how well we are doing when we collect people's stories. Now, to actually do this in the case of this particular study, which, as Rachel mentioned, was funded by AHRQ, we collected using these short sequences of open-ended questions, what we call elicitation protocols, we collected experiences from about 750 different people talking about their own health care. But we had to know, in order to determine whether the elicited narratives were good, were effective, we had to have a gold standard against which to compare them. And so for 100 of those cases, about three weeks after we did the elicitation protocol, we went back, and we in this case was Rachel and one other interviewer, went back and had long intensive interviews, hour, hour and a half, sometimes as long as two hour interviews, where they very carefully probed what those healthcare experiences were. So those become the standard to which we compare. And when we're trying to judge whether those short little five question elicitations worked, it's relative to the content of information that was derived from those intensive interviews. Now, one of the things we very quickly established was that this is not as easy as it initially sounds. And that even if you try to do it carefully, you don't exactly get it right the first time. So, in this particular protocol that we developed, and this is the first of our elicitation protocols, which we did for outpatient clinical care, we had to do basically two rounds of elicitation work before we got the protocol working reasonably well. Even though we spent a lot of time and care working on that first version. So what you have on this slide are the results of a particular dimension of performance, in this case completeness how much of the patient's story got told in the short elicitation compared to those long interviews. And you'll see there are clusters of three bars, and this is a motif which is going to repeat across slides, so let me explain them to you. The blue bar is the full sample, all the people who participated in the elicitation for whom we had comparative interviews. But we also, as we were testing the elicitation, we wanted to see if it would work equally well in telephone mode, where people were just telling their stories to a, to a person on the other side of the line, and web-based, where they're actually writing down their stories. So the green bar in all these slides is phone mode. The gold bar in all these slides is web. So verbal elicitation, written elicitation. 
And if you look at the cluster on the left, you will see that in our first elicitation protocol we developed, we did okay. Overall, we got 45% of the content. That is, 45% of the time that someone in the intensive interview said something about a domain of care that mattered to them, we captured it in the short-term elicitation. It was a little better over the phone, about 50% hit rate over the phone, about 40% over the web. But what we did was carefully go back, look at the performance of that initial elicitation, figure out what domains we were getting good response to, what domains we weren't, and we tweaked. We changed the protocol, and then we went back into the field again. And we got what is represented by the right-hand bars, that cluster of three. Elicitation overall went up from about 45% to about 60% meaning that if someone said something in the very intensive interviews, there was a 60% chance it was also captured in the short elicitation. And happily, as you will see, the web and phone elicitation methods completely evened out. So we were doing equally as well by phone when people were just telling their stories as in the web and when people were writing their stories down. So first key lesson. This is not easy stuff. To do this well takes time, effort, investment, and refinement over time. Now, let me walk you through briefly how well we did with the second version, the final version of the protocol in each of our four dimensions of rigor. So remember, the first one is completeness. How well do we get people to tell their story? Now, this is kind of a complicated bar, complicated chart. So don't get overwhelmed by it. Over on the left is exactly what we looked at in the previous slide. This is the overall performance. Blue bar uh, for the full sample, green for the phone, gold for the wet. As you will see on the right-hand side of the chart, <coughs> what we did was break down patient experience into 10 different domains. Uh, their interactions with staff, coordination of care, how competent the doctor seemed, how did they give them ample time, how well were they communicating, and we constructed separate completeness scores in each of those 10 domains. And you can see they vary a lot. For staff, if someone said something about staff in the intensive interview, they almost always also wrote that down or communicated it in the elicitation. We were close to 100% on that domain. And we did really well in some other domains, coordination of care, completeness, pretty well in caring and competence. So there were a number of domains where we were really doing a pretty good job in this short five-minute elicitation, capturing things that were conveyed in the intensive interview. But then you will notice there are a few domains we didn't do so well. Uh, what we call orientation, how aggressive the medical practice was of that clinician, uh, how thorough they were, uh, and how much shared decision-making they were. Now, these are, for people who care about health system performance, pretty important dimensions. And the fact that we didn't do as well by them isn't great. But the reason we didn't do as well is that these are dimensions patients actually don't care about very much. And we talk a lot about shared decision-making as an attribute of good, but you know the truth is that most patients don't give that that much salient. So the places where we got really high bars, where the elicitation protocol was working best in matching the interview content, were the places where the patients really cared and really wanted to communicate. Where we did less well were places where patients had less, saw less salience. All right. So that's the first dimension. Second dimension, balance. Again, balance means is the mix and good and bad evaluations in the elicitation similar to that mix that emerged in the intensive interview. So here we have a slightly different metric. You'll see there's a blue line going across at 1.0. If the elicitation has exactly the same mix of positive and negative that the interview did, it gets scored a one. If it's a little more positive in the elicitation than the interview, it gets scored above one. If it's, if it's more negative, it gets scored below one. And so what you see in each of these four different clusters are different 
criteria we used for assessing that. How many things people mentioned, how, much, how many lines of the transcript they spent on them, if an independent person went through and coded them, how positive versus negative did they sound. And the good news is, across all these different performance metrics, we ended up scoring very close to one. That is, the balance of positive and negative looked very similar in the elicitation that it had in the intensive interview. If anything, there is a little bias for the elicitations to be a little more positive than the intensive interviews were, but not by much. And they're really very close in terms of their overall balance. All right, so that was criteria two. Criteria three, uh, meaningfulness. Now, obviously, meaningfulness is a little bit in the eye of the beholder. It depends on who's listening to it, who's reading the transcript. And so in order to try to replicate that, we had two different uh, coders, graduate students, go back in, hadn't participated in the interviews, hadn't participated in the elicitations, and read these afresh and say, OK, could I tell what had happened to this person? And we had a total of six different dimensions of how narratives work well, of how people derive meaning from those. And those six dimensions we added up into this overall category we called coherence. That's captured on the left-hand side of the graph. Again, blue bar is the overall sample, green bar is the phone sample, gold bar is the web-based. And what you can see is we did pretty well. The elicitation protocol had about 60% of the coherence or meaningfulness of the overall intensive interview. But here, once again, there's a dis slight divergence between phone and web. About 70% coherence ratings on the phone, only about 50 on the web. And it's just that people tell their stories in a somewhat more coherent manner when they tell the story as opposed to writing it down. Now, we looked at each of the six different dimensions of coherence. And for many of them, we didn't find much difference between phone and web. The place where there was the big difference is captured over here in that middle cluster, what's called texture. How much detail was there in the story? And you could see this is where the phone and the web really diverge. When people are verbally explaining their story, they just go into more detail kind of like Bill Clinton last night at the Democratic Convention. When they're writing things down, they tend to be a little more parsimonious. So that was where we were getting the, the big difference. And that influences a little bit the overall coherence of the narrative. Finally, last but not least, we have the fourth dimension, which, there we go, of representativeness. Again. Do we get people who are not used to telling their stories to tell their stories in an equally coherent way? And so to do this, we identified three groups that we saw as potentially at risk. People who had less education, because we know they tend to be less likely to give voice to their experiences. People who were seriously ill who have very complicated experiences, and they therefore may have trouble conveying the full depth and breadth of those experiences. And the elderly, who grew up and came of age in an area where kind of informed, activated consumerism was less common in medical care. So again, blue bars capture the overall average sample. The gold bars, in this case, the high school or less educated sample. Red bars, people who've been seriously ill, and we oversampled for them to get them to be one third of our sample. The gray bars, metaphorically speaking, capture the people 65 plus. What we have are a bunch of different clusters because we're looking at a bunch of different measures, including a very simple measure just of word count, that just how much did they communicate in the elicitation relative to the interview. And the good news is that across the board, for all three of these groups that we thought were at risk for not saying enough, on average, they were just as communicative, had just as big a scope, had just the same balance, conveyed just as coherent a narrative as the average person in the sample. Indeed, if anything, these three groups who we thought were going to be at risk actually did better in all those dimensions than average. 
All right, so just to bring things to a close now, uh, what we take away from this is that it is possible to use a very short elicitation protocol, a five-minute protocol, to capture the heart, the essence, and the balance and completeness of people's stories of outpatient encounters. We did this in an experimental setting. Uh, we've, it's now been pilot tested in California and Massachusetts, and Massachusetts Blue Cross is this year about to take it live in the first large-scale implementation. So they're convinced they think they can make this work. We're pretty convinced that's true. Uh, we hope that in the near future we will see much larger scale adoption and we will develop elicitations that apply in other settings other than just the clinical setting. All right, Rachel, back to you. Thank you, Mark. Okay, so project number two that we're going to highlight today is the database of patient experience and this is a project that's really focused on eliciting rich narratives about health and health care from a much smaller number of patients but focused in a particular area. And I'm going to highlight for you in just a few minutes experiences that young adults have with depression. But the concept of creating DIPEX, or the Database of Individual Patient Experience, was to form an evidence base very similar to the work that the Cochrane Collaborative has done to forward evidence-based medicine, which many of you may be familiar with. In other words, to have a systematic way of understanding in a a robust fashion what things are like from the patient's point of view. And you can see here on the slide some of the reasons why this is important. Our colleagues at Oxford University who um, initiated this project and really um, pioneered the methodology more than 15 years ago were interested in all of these things. What are the questions and problems that matter to patients? How can clinicians learn about the patient's point of view in a meaningful way? How can other patients or caregivers learn what they need to know about patients' experiences with particular kinds of problems, whether that be depression or cancer or heart disease or what it's like to raise a child with autism, palliative care, end-of-life care? Um, Menopause, in the UK they have done more than 90 of these studies that are called modules on all of these questions and they have been used in all of these ways, resources in educational settings for health professionals, for patients and caregivers, for the community, and also to inform policy. So I am going to um, actually show you how this works in a minute, but I just want to walk through some of the um, fundamentals of the methodology first. It's a methodology that marries rigorous qualitative research studies in these particular areas of health and healthcare with a public-facing website that can be used by all of the audiences I just was discussing on the prior slide, and the aim is to represent the broadest possible range of perspectives. So we are looking for maximum variation in sampling here. We certainly detect themes in the data, what most people say um, characterizes their experience of depression or of prostate cancer or of um, palliative care. But um, we also are looking for the story that's not told so yet, um, so that we can be sure that we're not um, hearing only the loudest voice or the dominant narrative, but rather are seeking out stories that are less told or perspectives that have been intimated in an earlier intensive interview but not yet fleshed out. We do um, interviewing until saturation occurs. That's the term in qualitative research that means that you're not hearing much or anything that's new anymore. And then you know that you've really captured um, in a comprehensive way patients' experience in that domain. 
We do coding fairly similar to the coding process that Mark just highlighted for the elicitation project. And then we produce um, summaries for the public facing website that then embed these video and audio clips from the interviews that we have done. Uh, the interviews take place primarily in people's homes or in a community setting. Um, and most of them are videotaped unless the, the participant would prefer just audio um, or that their interview be captured only in text on the website. So this uh, really brilliant intervention in the patient experience world that was pioneered at Oxford University, you can see the UK in the middle there, has now expanded to 12 countries. And we have other countries eager to join. The US team um, joined two years ago. And we were the 10th country to join. You can see here where else this is happening. And we are all united under the umbrella of DPEX International, which um, helps us learn from one another and become smarter and have a greater impact with this wonderful methodology. In the US, the Health Experiences Research Network is the um, implementer of the DPEX methodology. And that's a partnership between the University of Wisconsin and Yale, uh, so myself and Mark, and then Johns Hopkins University and Oregon Health and Sciences University. And we will be growing our network uh, in the next few years. Here's a little snapshot of us. And I want to give a shout out to our colleague Nancy Pondy on the bottom uh, left there at the University of Wisconsin, who's done a tremendous job uh, working with me at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. We started out with two modules, Depression in Young Adults, which I'm going to show you in a second. And then the team in Oregon is working on a module that's focused on the experience veterans are having with traumatic brain injury. And you can see here we've got a number of other modules um, under review. We actually have a longer list than this, but it's just a, a taste of where we can go with this. Um, we're hoping to do lots of these studies and build modules quickly so that our database can uh, become robust in a short amount of time. The commitment of our Health Experiences Research Network here in the US is to listen to patients um, and really capture, again, that wide range of experiences and priorities um, to empower patients. And it's really worth noting that with this methodology, uh, patients hold on to their story. They decide what does and doesn't get used on the website. We very much stay in touch with them. They, uh, some of them become advisors to the project. Some of them are involved in dissemination. And some of them say, I just want to tell you my story. I'm giving you the gift of my story. And that's how I'm going to be engaged, um, which is a wonderful opportunity for those more quiet voices to be heard, people who are never going to volunteer for a committee or testify before Congress, but will tell you their story if you go to their home and you listen to it. Um, and again, this move from voice to voices is critical, the synthesis of what we've heard. I'm going to now uh, spend about 10 minutes uh, introducing you to our module and actually playing some clips for you. Here's our study team and our funders. Uh, we're grateful to all of them for the young adult hoods, uh, young adult experiences with depression module. We picked young adulthood for this first um, module in the US because it's such a period of change with graduations and marriage and um, life transitions of all kinds. Um, here's the flyer that we used. We recruited all around the country to do these interviews, asking people to tell their story to help others and to feel less alone. I think this was a really powerful message, um, again, for a lot of people who who can't even leave their home, uh, but were willing to do this. Here's a map of the sites around the country where we interviewed. We um, didn't travel to the South, uh, but we did specifically recruit people who were born in the South so that we could hear about some of the regional differences that might occur there. 
This is our web URL. Uh, I hope all of you check it out because we're going to have very little time here relative to the richness on the site to explore it. Um, but here's what our landing page looks like. And that first montage where it says young adults and depression in the US is uh, a bunch of people we interviewed talking about why they think this is an important way to capture uh, patient experience and why they wanted to participate. You can see down the left hand in orange some categories that we organized our data in. Uh, first experiences with depression, what it means to live with depression, and there's a lot of categories, subcategories under there ranging from how depression feels and its signs and symptoms to what it's like to have depression and another kind of condition, an eating disorder, for example, or self-harming. We heard a lot about getting help from professionals, what it means to seek assistance and treatment. I'm going to play you some clips from there. Um, and a lot about what it means to help yourself and how people arrive at a process of feeling better, what strategies they develop for everyday life, uh, the meaning of spirituality and faith and healing for them, um, and then messages for others uh, that are characteristic of every module. So uh, you can see here what this looks like. We're going to show it to you live in a moment. Um, here are some of the categories under living with depression that I was just walking you through. And then you can see here the top bar of the website. Um, if you're over on the left-hand side where it's the topics, you can see the summaries developed of the topic areas. Um, but you can also go into people's profiles and learn more about the individual folks who were uh, generous enough to tell their story and read their bios and hear all of the clips from their interviews. OK, so Lauren, over to you. OK, so we're going to uh, play some clips here, starting with how depression feels. Again, we analyze these data both for themes and for variation. And you're going to hear some of that here, uh, beginning with um, this clip from Marty that uh, Lauren has queued up for you at the top, talking about what depression feels like to him. Just one moment as I, as I get it up for us. OK. At the top of these pages, we generally have sort of an overview, a clip of patient's overview experience. And then we go into much more detail, again, highlighting uh, variation so that anybody with depression coming to the site would be most likely to find somebody on the site speaking to their experience. OK, here we go. But the sound is coming through. No, we're not getting sound. Sorry. All right. All right. We may have to do play on the screen, and I will hold up at the sound recording coming through. Okay. Should we just try one? If it doesn't work, I'll just walk people through. Um, but it's much more powerful to hear the people we interviewed talking about their experience than to hear uh, a researcher summarizing it. And that really is a lot of the power of this methodology, um, because instead of the, the writing of somebody summarizing what was learned or having a text clip, you can actually hear people's voices although perhaps not on this webinar. <laughs> no, we'll do it the other way. Right from OK. You know what, Lauren? We're, it, it's OK. Let's just run down through there, and I'll, I'll, I'll highlight a little bit of, uh, of it, because we're running short on time anyway, and it's fine. I'll, we, can, we can just OK, well, then hop, yeah, take over the website, then. You can yeah, can that's fine. That one. OK. See, these qualitative methodologies require a little bit of flexibility, and we're demonstrating that to you live. <laughs> this is what happens when you're interviewing in someone's home and 
their dog starts barking or uh, you have you have some surprises. Okay, so Lauren, I'm gonna scroll with this, okay? Absolutely. Okay. So here you can just get a feel for how we we organize these really rich patient experience data. Um, we heard a lot from patients about metaphors that they use. This is not necessarily what you hear in the clinical encounter, but it is when people tell their, their full story. Um, and these categories, again, emerge directly from the data, feeling numb, empty, and comfortable in misery. Um, here's a really powerful clip from a young man, uh, Pete, who you see pictured here, who really hadn't talked to anyone about his depression until he uh, was willing to do this interview, nobody besides his therapist um, and me. And I think it was really powerful for him to tell his story and feel like he could help others. Um, low self-esteem, another thing. If you'd like to play with the clips, we could have the audio come through here for people. Okay. Let's let's try Pete. Let's, we'll just try one, and then I'll I'll kind of go back to my slides. Great. I'm gonna give it a shot. Yeah. Into the room and lock lock it up. And it's just it, to me. It's um. It's just it, it's like being in a very comfy prison. And so it's like it's. It's something I don't want to do, but I'm so familiar. It's so familiar. It's just so cozy. Mm -hmm. So it feels safe and yeah, relaxing. Right. Yeah, but even wanting to go back there just makes me like, mm. like, why would I want to go back to a place that I want to go to every time I get upset? Okay. Um, given that we're short on time, Lauren, let's let's jump back to the slides, and we'll finish up. And if people want to stay on afterwards, we can we can play more clips, and you can also explore this website on your own. Okay, so again, this patient experience methodology is uh, critical for bringing in those voices that wouldn't be heard through other engagement activities. This here's a quote from. Um, Susan Cain, who wrote the book Quiet, and talked about how we really um, favor the extrovert ideal. And it's critical for patient experience work to be able to elicit those quieter voices, um, helping to amplify them through that, the various strategies of elicitation we've highlighted here, um, hoping that every voice can be heard. One of our participants in the depression study, Maya, highlighted how important it was to her to tell her story, partly because she doesn't want people with depression to be seen as playing only those low notes on the piano. Uh, she wanted those very high highs that she experiences to be part of the public discourse. Natasha talked to us about how important it was to her to add her voice to our understanding of patients' experiences because she felt her situation was unique coming from a really small rural village and being a queer person. So in sum, before we turn to your questions, we are dedicated to moving from this idea that we could possibly have a standardized patient or a patient in the singular um, to the idea with patient experience that we need these multiple voices, we need a montage, we need uh, rigor and, and representativeness so that we can get uh, balanced, meaningful, and complete stories in the public domain to improve health and health care and enrich our public discourse. Please do check us out at healthexperiencesusa.org. Um, and for the Dr. Zeus fans out there, the, the title that we came up with for this webinar reminded me of this idea that there are many places to go. I think it's a really exciting time for patient experience. And we look forward to talking with you about your thoughts about our projects or the future of patient experience more generally. Your questions.
Great. Thank you so much for that incredibly thoughtful and comprehensive and very moving um, presentation. I do encourage people to look at the videos and apologize that we weren't able to really uh, do as much of that as we thought we were going to be able to. Um, so I do have a, a few questions from folks. Um, one is, if, if you could go into a little bit more detail about the patient stories, um, if they cross healthcare settings, or is that part of um, the methodology, and, and how did that work? So I'm thinking maybe this is a question about the elicitation study? Yes. Yes, I'm sorry. Yes. <laughs> OK. Mark, yes. you want to dive so, in? Yeah, so we designed the initial version of the elicitation to live inside of these patient experience surveys, which means that they're focused on particular context. So this first elicitation was designed to go with what's called the CG, Clinician and Group CAP survey. So it's about all the clinical encounters with a given clinician over the previous year. But you could easily imagine this applying to health plans, to hospitals. We just haven't gotten there yet. So eventually, we want to have elicitations that can both focus on particular settings other than the outpatient setting, but also summarize all experiences that people are having within a given period of time. Great. Thank you so much. Um, I also wanted to acknowledge uh, Janice Singer, who is on the line and participated in the elicitation study for um, Massachusetts. And I'm not sure if we can take her off mute in order to, for her to comment if that's possible. Um, if not, I just wanted you guys to know that she was on the line um, as well. Fantastic. If you'd like to unmute her, you, you can. Do you see her there? And she's green on the screen. Oh, great. Oh, hi. This okay. is Jan. Hi, this is Jan Singer. Can you hear me? Yeah. Hi, yep. Jan. Hi. Um, yes, we were one of the um, places that got to be part of, of the um, elicitation um, project. And um, we actually tested both the five questions uh, that the, um, this team had developed in a three-question uh, elicitation that another team had developed. And the five question actually provided you know, slightly more information and, and better nuance. So we have taken those five questions and have put them into our annual patient experience survey. Uh, for all those who act, go online to complete the survey, uh, they can answer those five questions. And so it's only an online, it's, it's not a voice um, process. And we're just getting the results from this first full year of doing it right now. So we'll be excited to see what we learn. We're excited too. Wonderful. And, and this Actually, is, this is, um, uh, Fatima, do you mind me jumping in? This is Marcy Nielsen. Sure, I sure. Know, I, I think um, Mark and, and, and Rachel on the last question. So tell me tell me when I can be in the queue, Fatima. Great, great. I actually have one question that was relevant to what was just said, and then um, you can go ahead. So we have a, a participant who, um, which Janice kind of just spoke to, is wanted some clarity around whether the shorter survey could be done instead of CG caps um, and arrive at equally valid results. Complicated and controversial question. <laughs> Uh, the, as, as, Jan, as Jan will mention, they actually tested the elicitation in the context of a shortened version of CAPS, which seemed to perform quite well, uh, although I'm not sure that's the official CAPS position on that. Uh, uh, the one thing that's important, though, is we don't want to think about the open-ended questions replacing the closed-ended questions. They each capture something different and important about patient experience. And uh, particularly if you're using them for reimbursement purposes, you still need some closed-ended metrics that you can tie to reimbursement. And so think of them as complements rather than substitutes. Great. Thank you. Marcy? Yeah, th this, um, my, my question is um, hopefully uh, a little less controversial, but I'm, I'm suspecting, um, I'm suspecting not and and that is 
the, the world of gathering data around patient experience through CAPS, as, as, uh, as Mark and Rachel well know, and wasn't the purpose of, of this call, but, but it's often frustrating for providers. And it's frustrating for lots of, of different reasons, um, one of which is its lack of richness, uh, and that is certainly where uh, this research is so important. But if you could put your, your very practical hat on um, and step into the role of a primary care practice that is still operating in fee-for-service, still very much having to, um, to operate on the hamster wheel, but who cares deeply about their patient's experience um, of, of care. How would you suggest that they use the, the work and the research that, that, that you've done? All right, so that's a great so question. Can, yeah, and really, yeah. And so, uh, Rich, do you want to dive into that first? Um, sure, to... yeah. I mean, we are hoping that, that these data will be highly relevant for, for those practices. And we have a sense from the, the testing and the meetings around the country that there is a hunger for it. Marcy, we haven't yet um, taken the, the next step, which we're eager to take and, and about to take of experimenting with how to feed the qualitative data back to practices. Um, but our, our belief, really our conviction, is that it's going to answer for practices questions about why that have to do with their ratings. Uh, and they, you know, they have to pay attention to their ratings for obvious reasons related to reimbursement, as you alluded to, but if their ratings change, they go up or down, they don't have a sense of why. Um, I think that the elicitation data is a, a key to that, to understanding uh, why the ratings are what they are and giving much more concrete um, suggestions and experience data that teams can use to uh, improve their practice and to continue highlighting what's working well. Uh, and I really want to emphasize that last point. It's not only about uh, fixing problems, but it's about knowing what has mattered so much to patients uh, that they can be proud of and keep doing. Yeah, so let me also speak to that. Uh, when Rachel and I were doing a, a New England Journal of Medicine webinar, the same very question came up. And the analogy that we use, because we're both academics and we teach, is to go back to teaching evaluations. And believe me, there is nothing more low-tech than teaching at the university level for, uh, for dealing with hamster wheels and the like. And so uh, things you learn when you teach and you get these evaluations is that the ratings don't really matter, not the numeric ratings. What matters are the stories that people tell that explains what they get and what they don't get in equal measure, positive and negative. And what we've learned from these elicitations is 80% of the feedback is positive. But even for people who had largely positive experiences, they'll often have one or two important negatives to convey, not because they're critical people, but because they want to make things better. I think that is a beautiful um, explanation and way in which to to end this uh, webinar. We, we deeply care about the health of the patients and the communities in which they live, but we also care a lot about the primary care practices who, who are exhausted. And um, we talk about the triple aim, and I appreciate Rachel showing that slide, but we're talking more at the PCPCC about the quadruple aim and the, the importance of joy in practice and, and giving clinicians the opportunity to connect to their patients. And so this, this kind of research that is qualitative um, can help I think uh, clinicians connect to the joy because as an academician myself back in the day, um, there was nothing better than getting uh, the evaluations that, that, that reinforced what I was doing well and, and 
explained, explained being the key, what I needed to work on. Not just told me I needed to work on, explained what I needed to work on. And so uh, I, I think it's a perfect analogy, Mark. Um, Emma, I know you are going to end the webinar because we're over, but um, maybe you want to reinforce to no. folks who join the call about the opportunity for um, office hours with Mark and Rachel. Yes, yes. Actually, the webinar will be over, but um, the folks can stay on the line for office hours. And there were a few questions in the queue that we didn't get a chance to get to. So I am very much hoping that those folks will have an opportunity to ask their questions now during office hours. I feel like there should be a classroom gong that just went off. Exactly. Office hours. <laughs> and Sign up on the door. Filing out. <laughs> exactly. Well, again, I, I, I would want to thank you. I do need to run to my next meeting, and I will, um, I will let all the other students um, get time with, with the professors. Um, but a uh, terrific presentation. We look forward to integrating the narrative and qualitative research into the patient-centered medical home and, and primary care uh, movement. And um, look forward to working with you both more. Great. Thanks so much, Marcy. Likewise. Okay, Fatima, how do we do how do we do office hours? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if she's on mute. Um, there are a number of other questions here. Fatima, are you still online? Oh, yes. I'm sorry. I was. I had myself back on mute, and I was talking. Um, I was wondering <laughs> if we should just unmute everybody who's remaining on the line so that we can have a discussion. How how will that work? Is that too much? Right now, there are still 60 people on, but it might not be too much if yeah, they all talk at once. So yeah, we like have. I. Make sure you're, um, that you're there on the phone or on front of your computer um, and let know ahead of time. Great. So is Michelle Carrick still on the line? Um, she had some question, a question about uh, if, whether or not demographics, gender, age, race were captured. Um, yes, they were for the elicitation study. Yeah, for, for actually yes. for both projects. Um, okay, great. They were they were captured, and for the elicitation study, um, as I think Mark highlighted, we used a uh, panel of respondents representative of the U.S. population. We um, were very explicit about all of those demographic dimensions, um, and for the DPEX study, we we again sample for maximum variation, and we include all of those demographics she listed and others in thinking about how to get how to capture the diversity of experiences. Great. Um, I had a question and I believe uh, Tiffany Simpson is still on the line as well if she wants to unmute her phone. She had a question about the possibility of, of um, further studies and if any of these pilots will be going to uh, will be uh, implemented in the South. So Tiffany, can you unmute your line if you want to? Oh, you already are. If you want to chime in. Oh, yes. Um, thanks for taking my question. So I represent the South Carolina Office of Rural Health, where we have a very um, robust patient-centered medical home program that falls under a greater umbrella of our Center for Practice Transformation. By and large, the majority of our practice are rural health clinics. Our practices are rural health clinics that have technical assistance from a QI coach at least on um, at least twice a month. And so my question is just because of the sheer burden of chronic disease in um, the, the Bible Belt for, you know, just, you know, all the southern states in terms of the chronic disease burden and the lack of resources in a lot of these practices. Do you have concrete recommendations in terms of how 
uh, these practices can capture the patient experience because we're working with these practices and there's still a lot of this language around non-compliance or we tell them what to do but they still come back with elevated blood sugar, so on and so forth. So really just hardcore concrete recommendations. Uh, our QI coaches try to provide tools on the fly to capture the patient experience because this is really new territory for a lot of them. So I just wanted to provide some context in terms of what's been presented today and is there interest from an academic perspective of running these pilots and, and, and going from there. So just trying to paint a picture for you. Yeah, thanks. That's super helpful. I'll, I'll chime in first, and Mark, I'm sure you'll have a lot to add. Um, so um, I guess one question is whether you guys are doing um, any sort of patient experience survey, or is that integrated into your practice at all at this point? Are you getting uh, people to respond to those? Um, we are doing what I would consider um, a mini version of the CAP survey. I know that the QI coaches, because um, this is a part of what they need to do to get PCMH accreditation. So right. Um, right. this is new territory for them. So literally like these small one-pagers that either the practice manager can, you know, pull patients, you know, and go through the, the process with them. But something that's more consistent that could be systematized because these practice practices are overburdened. They have all of these competing interests. They're trying to make payroll. They have, you know, three FTE to service patients in a wide, isolated geographic area, and then we're asking them to do this on top of that. So it is a part of the process because they have to do it to get accreditation, um, but at the same time, it needs to be standardized. And so, and, and, and I heard a lot of that on this webinar. So just really looking to you all, number one, to you know, test this population. It's great that, um, you know, in some cases folks that were born in the South were interviewed and they were subjects for the research, but it's nothing like being on the ground and especially in rural. Yeah, I agree. agree. And we, we would love to, to, to stay in touch with you because, uh, you know, I think we could learn from you as well. Go ahead, Mark. Uh, and, and I think one of the things that is useful and good is this our little elicitation protocol that we that we've developed it's it's just five questions and it's freely available to everyone it was developed under ARC funding we will we could get it to you guys we could talk to your quality assistance coaches uh, the it's they're pretty straightforward questions that people actually enjoy answering and so you can give people uh, a written version of this and have them just write down their responses and the good news is it's not fancy stuff right you just what you need to do is have some time either for the QI coach or the clinicians to be able to set aside a little time and read them and then we'll get the message it doesn't require statistics it doesn't require anything fancy it just requires people to take the time to read okay wonderful and I just wanted to add in terms of the the DPEX project that um, our hope is as we grow it to be able to use these videos with QI teams um, even if they weren't developed specifically on location, although they can be. Um, there's a whole sort of process around QI that's been developed in the UK for using these, which we're just starting to test out here. But they can be really powerful um, because <laughs> that we can play them well here you know, hearing people and seeing them on video um, can can give that feedback for clinicians and, and parts of all of these web modules really focus on experiences with care. What's it like in the clinic? What's it like connecting with providers? What works and what doesn't? Um, so over time, at least, we're hoping these will be great tools for practices all around the country. Thank you. And I just sent um, our director's um, information to you all just to further connect with her. Um, she has a dual appointment. She actually um, teaches at the 
University of South Carolina School of Medicine around patient-centered medical home principles, and she, we have, you know, the fortunate uh, benefit of having her as our director. So I sent that to you, and just right on the spot, we can use this. We have PCMH team meetings um, every other week, and we can just start sharing these tools, you know, and, and just right. as a feature, an education feature in our team meetings, just to get the creative juices flowing as to how to use this to help our practices. So thank you. Great. Thank you. Thanks, Tiffany. I'm glad you made that connection. This is Amanda chiming in from the PCPCC, and I just wanted to call on the next folks for, for their questions. Jan, Jan Singer, first I wanted to circle back with you. It looks like your hand is, is raised. Hello? Hey. Hello? Hi, this is Jan Singer. Um, did you want to, did you have a question for me? I think maybe, maybe Amy's line went, Fatima, are you still there? Um, well, one thing I can say um, is that I, I really agree with, with, with everything that you've both um, talked about, but particularly how the narratives give context. Um, we had great examples where you know, people got you know, reasonably good you know, responses on the, on the um, close ended, but uh, the, the, the narratives at the end gave a much greater flavor of where there were maybe some pitfalls and things that people needed to take, be concerned about or take care of or at least know how to approach a problem as opposed to just looking at the, um, the close ended in the score of, of 82 or whatever it would be. Um, so, so it really helps the providers to understand you know, where they, they should be making improvements and where what they're doing is working really well. Great. Excellent. All right, sorry, are either Amanda or Fatima still on? Are they meeting themselves? I'm still here. Uh, Amanda says Lost it went silent for her. How about you, Fatima, are you still there? We might have been together. I'm, I'm still here. Um, so, Lauren, can you, can you see the questions that came in? Because you may have to take over the organizing role. Exactly, yeah. I'm um, trying to see which we had not gotten to. Um, I believe people are leaving their, their content information. People ask about implementing pilots. They just ask that question. Um, sorry, I'm, I think that I'm not seeing any any questions that haven't been asked yet. It's more cool. Uh, if anyone, has well, if anyone else wants like to, to unmute and ask a question, we're here, and otherwise we can bring things to a close. Lauren, do you want to just unmute everybody who's still on there, and that way anybody who wants to jump in can? Yeah, if anyone else, if someone wants to raise their virtual hand there on, on the thing, I will unmute you and ask your question that way. Let's see if anyone. Uh, here are the questions. All right. All right, you're. Hey there. Yeah, I, my name is Una uh, Mecca. I yeah. I'm very happy joining the discussion. I participated actively and I've learned so much and I hope I'm calling from Nigeria. I hope that uh, somehow this uh, tool will be implemented here in Nigeria. I know there are cultural differences, but I know somewhat it can be implemented in Nigeria too. 
I want to thank you very much for this great presentation. Thank you. We we also hope that it can have international application, and we are we haven't yet tested uh, fully, but we know that the instruments are being translated into a variety of different languages as part of the Blue Cross Blue Shield application, and so we hope to be able to take this more broadly quickly. GIPEX is already international. Rachel, do you want to speak to that? Yeah, so I think you saw the, the slide that showed the 12 countries who have joined so far, but there's a concerted effort to expand, um, particularly into Africa and Latin America and other places on the globe um, that have not yet joined um, and processes underway to do that. So hoping for those 12 to be 24 and 48 and 100 before long, because I think these, uh, these rich videotaped interviews can be so useful to, to primary care providers, uh, patients, and communities everywhere. Anybody Ryan, else? Anyone else Ryan? raising hand? Yeah, and just everyone else wants to raise their virtual hand while I mute you. I just uh, the question asker. I just had to mute because there was some uh, outside noise. But yeah. Before we wrap up, is there any last questions anyone would like to, to ask? Okay, I think right. give another five right. seconds or so, but. You can always email Amanda, you, us. We are easily found. <laughs> yes. You can track us down, and we are happy to respond to any additional questions that come up at any time in the near future. So if anyone has any other questions, they are happy to have you reach out to them. And um, any last points or any last, last things to mention before we wrap things up? Oh, thank you for being such a terrific audience, and uh, we hope to remain in touch with those of you interested in this work. Thank you all. Thank you, guys. We'll be, um, Thanks, Lauren. We'll be, Bye, we'll be posting these, these slides on the website within 24 hours, as well as a recording of this session uh, to share around. And um, we thank you for, com for coming on, and we look forward to seeing you next time. Thank you. Great. Thank you, everyone. Bye.